All right. Good morning, everybody. Yes, end of a long week or a short one, depending on whether you're counting lectures or actual effort. Um, okay, so welcome back to uh, ECN 5817. Uh, today, we are going to actually do two lectures, um, so we'll get through the first one. Um, we will just kind of finish off what we were talking about last time, which was the design of a resonant inverter, and then we will actually do a particular uh, design example. All right. So, um, just a few reminders on the announcements. There's nothing new here. Uh, as I just said, we'll have our follow-up lecture right after this one. And then I have office hours from 12 to 1 today. So those who are um, uh, remote can call in at that time. Uh, the homework, um, this isn't written here. Homework 9 is actually due on Monday. Uh, so you have this extra weekend to do that. But homework 10 is already out. Um, so um, you probably want to get started on that as well. And that is due um, uh, the regular Friday time at 10 a.m. So next week, Friday, uh, that homework is due. Uh, homework 10, I tried to keep it um, shorter. Um, I think it is, but um, well, let, you, you, you'll be the actual judge of that. Uh, the final exam will go out um, uh, two weeks from now. Again, Friday, May 2nd, and that's due back uh, the following Wednesday, May 7th. Everything's 10 a.m. Mountain time. All right, so let's sort of um, pick up where we left off. Just sort of as a reminder, what we were doing was the design of a resonant inverter uh, with specifications um, that are sort of typical. Uh, the first one being that you have to meet the load characteristics, and we kind of know how to do that. You overlay the load characteristic curve onto the output um, characteristic of the resonant um, inverter. And once you've done that, you've at least met your minimum requirements, then you're after trying to improve efficiency. Or one thing you want to do is minimize conduction losses, especially losses as uh, the output power scales down, so that you maintain high efficiency at low loads. Um, the way to do that, or at least the approach to do that, would be to make sure that your currents on uh, the input of the tank also scale back as the output current of the tank is going down. Right? And that basically tells us to look at the input impedance as a function of the load resistance, and we did that. Um, and then the other thing is switching losses, especially in resonant converters. Those are important because the whole objective of going to resonant converters is to increase switching frequency. And therefore, you are looking to minimize these losses. Um, and with MOSFETs, which is typically your preferred mode of switching. Uh, you want zero voltage switching. And the way, again, there was to look at the input impedance and its phase and make sure that it is an inductive phase, at least in the range of load resistances that are of most importance to you. Right? Um, ideally, for all uh, operating conditions, but at least for the operating conditions where most of the losses will occur, or the losses will be significant to even destroy your devices. All right. All right. So that was sort of uh, the big picture. Um, and again, the way we approach this, the first part of scaling back the input current with, uh, um, with sort of increase in load resistance was sh um, we were able to sort of uh, prove that as long as we could figure out what the input, res input impedance did at um, the two extreme cases of the load resistance being zero to the load resistance being infinite, then everything in between was just a monotonic function. So by investigating the property of uh, the input impedance at those two extreme cases, we can tell that whether this tank, or at least this tank at particular frequency, is the way we would want it, or is it absolutely the opposite of what we would want. So it's either going to increase that in, uh, the input impedance is increasing with R, or it's decreasing, or it's going to be flat, but it's not going to go up and down as R changes. Right? Uh, and uh, we kind of saw that here in the case of the LCC resonant tank, where we were able to sort of sketch out the 
um, input impedance with R being 0 and then with R being um, infinite and we know that um, at any particular frequency as R changes it's just going to monotonically go from um, a particular value let's say at R equal to 0 up to the value at R equal to infinity and what we'd really like to do is that the R equal to infinity value be higher than the R equal to 0 value. So everything below this frequency FM where these two um, curves intersect is good but the behavior above this frequency FM is bad because there the uh, Z infinite value is actually lower than the Z zero value. Right? Now the our other um, um, constraint was that we wanted to also have zero voltage switching and zero voltage switching we can basically observe by looking at the slopes of the input impedance because they tell us sort of the, the phase of the input impedance and so where it looks capacitive is bad where it looks inductive is good um, as you can see below this frequency F naught you're going to always have an input impedance that's capacitive so you certainly don't want to operate below F naught um, even though that was very nice from a back, um, from the property that your um, currents were backing off with increasing R but this kind of doesn't really help you with ZVS um, above F infinity which is the resonant frequency with um, the output resistance being infinite was really nice in respect to uh, ZVS properties but was really bad in terms of the uh, the current input current scaling with the increasing resistance right so this strange is again out right so you so both of these sort of um, cases above F infinity and below F0 um, were bad in one or the other um, sort of um, metric for efficiency so what remains is really the range between the two and there we saw that if we sort of look at these shaded curves which sort of span this space which are really sort of numerically computed um, between z equal to uh, with uh, between r equal to 0 and r equal to infinity those have slopes which partly um, are inductive and then as r increases further they become more and more capacitive right so there is some value some critical value of resistance r beyond which they become capacitive below which they are inductive right um, and below FM we know that um, the input current scales back as R increases so really the frequency of interest then is between F naught and FM right so what we would really like to do is probably uh, focus in and um, operate somewhere in this range right so this may be our uh, best bet for um, frequencies if you can't read that let me write best bet in black best bet right so that's that's probably our best bet uh, of course that best bet is only um, good up to a certain let's see what color should I pick let me pick uh, oh, oh keep the best bet orange uh, it only good up to a certain value of R so here this is inductive that's good this is inductive that's good that's going to give us ZVS here is kind of where it's sort of uh, you're starting to lose uh, ZVS right so somewhere as R increases uh, this way um, you're going to be okay but after some value um, maybe that's your there might be your uh, critical value beyond that you're going to lose ZVS right so we have sort of um, ZVS here and then above this um, so, um, so here you have ZVS out here uh, you don't have ZVS so no ZVS right you do have ZCS but that's typically what you don't want or you don't really doesn't give you much advantage uh, for MOSFETs operating at high frequencies 
Okay. Um, and this particular value of R critical, we could actually numerically compute. Um, and we sort of prove this formula as well. Uh, and that's really given by uh, simple uh, things that we can calculate. Um, it's the uh, absolute value of the output impedance with the input shorted uh, multiplied by the square root of the ratio of the um, negative of the input impedance infinity um, divided by the uh, input impedance zero. Right? And that really gives you that R critical value. And that R critical value only has a real value if your Z input zero and Z input infinity have opposite phase. So if it is capacitive on one side and inductive on the other side, you will have an R critical value. But if it is capacitive on both extreme cases, well then obviously there is going to be no R critical value. And this formula would come up with an imaginary number also. Right? Okay. Um, so the I guess the, the only thing here, and this is kind of where we were um, at the end of it, kind of summarizing everything that I've already said. Um, the only thing remaining that might be useful um, to be able to compute is this value for um, FM. Right? Let me pick a different color. Um, so this crossover point FM, which is the upper limit to where we may want to operate. Uh, we just discussed that uh, range of, of interest for frequencies may be between this F0 and this Fm. And then here is uh, F infinity. So we may want to um, sort of design by putting our switching frequency somewhere here. That might be our Fs. Um, to find Fm, well, you have um, expressions for um, the zi infinity and zi um, zero, and um, um, you can basically um, equate those um, to figure out what Fm is. Um, that value of Fm is given here, um, you can, um, uh, let, me, let me see if I want to uh, get into that for a second. Um, we, can, uh, we can sort of do an approximate calculation. Give me one second. So, so actually, we can do a do an sort of a more exact calculation, which is which is what I'll do first. Um, and really, what we want to do to find FM, well, let's do that, um, is figure out where um, the in, where is the intersection of the magnitude of uh, zi uh, zero with zi infinity, right? That's that's what defines um, fm. This is our. Let me sort of color these. This is our zi infinity, and then. This is our zi zero. Um, so zi zero. Well, let's actually use this to compute these. Um, back to green. All right. So from here, zi infinity is uh, basically this circuit um, input impedance. This is our zi infinity as, as shown. And so that is simply going to be um, SL plus 1 over SCS 
plus 1 over S CP, right? As the output is open. And um, I can um, also write this at the switching uh, at the frequency, uh, which is which is what we're going to solve for. This is going to be J omega um, L minus J one over. Actually, let me just keep them separate. Omega C S minus J one over omega. CP, right? And then I can write also, um, uh, let's use red for that. I can find the value of uh, ZI0. And for ZI0, I will short this. So CP just goes away. And so my uh, ZI0, let's just do that here. Yeah, zero is going to be um, again, SL plus 1 over SCS, and that is J omega L minus J 1 over omega CS, okay? Um, now, what has to equal is the, um, um, is really the uh, magnitude of these, all right? And so, in equating these, um, I have to be careful about the signs. Um, so the magnitude of of z i phi is really uh, omega l minus one over omega c s, right? But it could be plus minus either way. So what I have to do is go back and just take a look um, whether this is going to have a plus sign or a minus sign, and that depends on if I look at z i zero. Zi0 at omega, at fm or at this omega has a positive slope, right? So it's, it is really an inductive uh, quantity. That means omega L is going to be greater than 1 over omega C. So this, the way I've written is correct, right? Otherwise, um, I, I, I would have reversed the sign, right? Uh, similarly, I can do um, the absolute value of uh, z i infinity and z i infinity if I look at that that looks capacitive right this is sloping the other way um, so there this is going to actually I have to reverse the signs so it's going to be 1 over omega c s plus 1 over omega c p minus omega l all right Make sense, right? So you have to be careful when you're sort of equating um, magnitudes that you also look at um, sort of uh, the phase of them to make sure that um, the whole thing isn't sort of flipped a sign um, when you're sort of trying to equate things or, or compute inequalities or things of that sort, right? Um, so now um, I can just equate those, um, and so I will have then this gives me omega L minus 1 over omega CS equals 1 over omega CS plus 1 over omega CP minus omega L. All right. Let me sort of um, move things around. So this becomes 2 omega L equals um, uh, 2 over omega CS plus 1 over omega Cp, right? Let me divide throughout by 2, right? So this goes away, this goes away, and I'll put a 2 here. And so this now just looks like um, omega, I can move the omega here, so this becomes omega squared L equal uh, 1, and I can rewrite, the, well, let me just rewrite like this. This becomes 1 over Cs plus 1 over 2 Cp, all right? This whole quantity on the right, 1 over Cs plus 1 over 2 Cp, can simply be written as 1 over the parallel combination of Cs with uh, 2 Cp, all right? And therefore, my omega 
uh, where these two things are equal, which is what we call omega uh, m. Um, from here, then I get omega m as simply equal to 1 over um, the square root of L times uh, C s in parallel with 2 C p. Okay. And divide omega m by 2 pi and you get f m, which is this expression right here. Okay. So, I hope you can read that even though it is sort of, let me clear that up a little. Okay. So, that is how you get that. Okay, I think we are pretty much done with anything that we could do in sort of analytically compute here um, and you get the big picture, right? right. That is the most important part. Okay, uh, this just kind of summarizes everything we have said, um, which is basically that um, the chart on the left basically shows you the behavior of uh, or actually um, tells you that as R changes, so here is your uh, load resistance. Um, whether you get ZVS or not, right? So, for frequencies below F naught, there is no region where you are going to get a ZVS, you are just going to get ZCS, right? Because it is always capacitive. So, this will always be uh, ZCS. Um, then, so th this is basically below F naught, um, above, above F infinity, it is always Z V S and then in between F naught and F infinity is where you can get either Z V S or Z C S and that really is determined by this boundary here. So, above this boundary here, you get uh, ZCS and below this boundary is where you get ZVS, okay. Um, and the value of this boundary, we have uh, a way to compute that. We have a formula for that. This basically um, is, is really the value of the load resistance. That is your R critical, uh, which will tell you where that boundary lies, okay. Um, you can also plot how the, um, let me sort of pick a different color, uh, green. You can also plot how the output zero impedance um, varies as you vary R and uh, um, let me sort of see what point I wanted to make regarding that. Yeah, uh, and yeah, the point I guess that we can make there is if we go back and look at what R critical was, um, yeah, let's use red for that. Uh, so our R critical value is um, simply the magnitude of uh, Z out zero. So it's the matched uh, impedance or the Thevenin impedance of the tank. Uh, times the square root of minus z input infinity over z input 0. Um, and if you um, um, recall that at fm, the whole definition of fm um, here, Uh, was where z input 0 and z out uh, input infinity were equal, right? So, at f m, we have uh, z output 0 in magnitude equal to uh, z output infinity and clearly then at that point, your r critical is just going to equal uh, z output 0, right? So, uh, this is equal to just z output 0 at um, f is equal to f m, right? And that's what you're seeing that your R critical is just equal to z output zero at f m. Right? 
That's all that curve is telling you. Um, there is a homework problem that I've added in, um, which talks about what's called a matching network. Now, we haven't talked about matching networks yet. I will cover them briefly in, um, in one of the lectures next week. But it's, a, first of all, a very simple problem. And second of all, everything you need to know to solve that problem, you can either do from just simple first principles, or you can actually get insight from what we're doing right here in solving that problem. So just to sort of, um, probably in, this, in the second session, I'll put a slide up and kind of just talk you through a matching network. But since we're on this slide, let me just sort of tell you conceptually um, what a matching network um, is. In fact, I won't write anything here so as to not to confuse. Yes? Just before going on, <coughs> going to the matching network, I have a quick, quick question. What is yes. ZCS? About ZCS? Yeah, why do you call it ZCS? Because at that point, when R is larger than R critical, mm -hmm. then we don't get the, Z, the, the, the ZVS. Mm -hmm. Why do you call it ZCS? OK, that's a good question. Um, so if you remember, for a resonant um, network, if we assume that the capac output capacitor of the devices is 0, which is what we've been assuming, then if the load is inductive, then you will automatically get zero voltage switching. And if the load is capacitive, you're going to automatically get zero current switching. Yeah. Right? Yeah. If the, yeah. So, so basically, our assumption throughout this analysis has been that we are ignoring the output capacitance of the devices. In reality, there is a buffer zone around this R critical where you get nothing. Right? So you have to be sufficiently inductive, and that also depends not. Uh, uh, so, so it depends on that uh, um, output capacitance of the device, and so that buffer zone will sort of expand and shrink depending on that. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, yes. So, so let, let me sort of um, just just say um, briefly. Maybe maybe I better draw something. Otherwise, this will. Right. Um, actually, I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do this. Um, yeah, my, my as well. I don't want to spoil this. But I'm getting distracted. All right. So we'll finish this. Then I'll talk about the matching network. All right. I don't want to spoil uh, this slide by adding something that's completely different. All right. So so here's here's basically the summary of of this. Um, the chart on the right basically just uh, again shows the same thing, except it's now actually plotting what is the phase of the input impedance as R uh, changes um, at different frequencies. So let me pick a different color here. Let's pick purple. All right. So here you have the angle of ZI. And again, we are going to have um, ZVS, again, assuming no uh, output capacitance on the transistors. We are going to get ZVS as long as the phase is positive. Right? So that basically um, is here. So for low values of resistance within this range, F0 and F infinity, you are getting your uh, CVS, and down here um, you're getting uh, ZCS, right? So below F0, it's always ZCS again, and above, uh, this is always ZVS, right? Because yeah. your phases are always uh, positive here, the phases are always negative down here. And only in this region do the phase go from being positive to negative as R uh, increases. Right? OK. Um, now, yeah. All right. So this is now probably a good point uh, for me to say a few words about a matching network. All right. So this is what we're going to do. I'm just going to add a slide uh, break here. Uh, So how do I cancel this? Uh, let's do keep. Uh, 
hopefully everything will be nice. All right. Okay. So uh, this is a little bit about just a just a sort of a break, and um, this is really uh, homework uh, problem ten point two. Right. So I just want to briefly um, talk about it because this I just don't want you to look at it and say, well, what is this thing? All right. So here, here's, here's really the problem 10.2. And this is actually a very practical problem. So suppose you have a power amplifier in your lab. Right? So let's say a RF power amplifier. I don't know how many of you are working at um, sort of uh, radio frequencies. But so let's say you have an RF uh, power amp. And the power amp you have uh, only is designed for uh, 50 ohm uh, match load, right? All right, and here comes your problem. You have a project to do in which the load is a 75 ohm load, All right? How do I connect this 75 ohm load to a 50 ohm power amplifier? All right, what you do is you basically build what's known as a matching network. Right? Now, those of you who still remember your ENM and transmission lines can probably go back and uh, see, sort of refer to that. Uh, but those who don't can simply refer to this slide. All right. So you you basically want to somehow drive. Um, a power amp that's designed to build a 75, uh, that's designed to power 50 ohm load, but actually run a 75 ohm load. All right. So you want to do an impedance transformation, right? Um, at sort of microwave frequencies, you can do, you can use sort of strip line structures to do that kind of stuff. That's the ENM kind of story. But even at uh, frequencies of interest to us, uh, in resonant converters, we can use lumped elements to sort of do them frequency match, right? And basically what it comes down to is I can put basically a lossless network, right, made up of L's and C's, right? So it's a lossless network. Uh, how I design it, I'll teach you next week. You really don't need to for the homework problem because you're given the topology of the lossless network. You're only asked to find the value of the L and the C that's used in it. And what you're asked to do is make sure that when I look in here, the impedance ZI looks, one, purely resistive. All right. And this is the point I wanted to make here, because you know that for any uh, particular value of resistance, there is a frequency and a tank structure that will give you zero phase, right? This boundary R critical is where ZCS and there is no ZBS and ZCS, which is basically zero phase point, right? So this is where this phase is zero, right? So there is a point for um, for a given load. Uh, uh, at a particular frequency by select properly designing that LC tank where you can make the input impedance be exactly uh, purely resistive, right? Um, and then the only other part that's left is to uh, pick the values in such a way that the input impedance actually looks like 50 ohms, right? So you have uh, two unknowns, an L and a C value. Um, and there are two conditions to meet. One, that it's purely resistive. And second, that the input impedance magnitude, uh, uh, the CI, well, it's purely resistive. The magnitude is just going to be, um, it, it's, it's just going to be a, a real number. So it's just an R. And you have to just make sure that this R then is equal to 50 ohm, right? So nothing to be scared about in this problem. But it's a really useful um, technique, uh, not only for this sort of application that I've spoken about, and that's also in the, in the problem, which is for this RF power amplifier. But as we will see, um, when we're designing resonant 
uh, networks, we can use these matching networks, one, to sort of match loads. So if you've designed, as we're going to now design in the next section, actually a resonant converter designed to deliver, let's say, uh, a particular amount of power and operate very nicely with a particular load, and then suddenly the load changes, well, you can go back and change the entire design of the resonant inverter that you just designed or add a matching network, right? That decision obviously depends on what's easier at that point. Obviously, if somebody sells you an inverter or a, or a box which works nicely at 50 ohms, you're not going to go back in and open the box up and redesign that whole thing. You're just going to put a matching network in between, all right? That's the whole point of a matching network. I thought such a practical application is such a useful thing that I could not not give you a problem on it. And so even though I haven't formally taught this to you, I've thrown in the problem. And we'll talk more about matching networks in greater detail, uh, much beyond what you will need for, for this problem and anything that I would give possibly in an, uh, in an exam. Uh, but that's a short brief on matching networks. OK. Any question on this before we move? Now we're going to actually go and do a design. No? All right. OK. Uh, let's move on to a design example. All right. Uh, so what we're going to do is look at a, a design which, again, is fairly practical. Uh, this is a resonant inverter designed using an LCC resonant tank, the one we've been looking at, um, designed to basically uh, act as an inverter. Uh, there's, no, uh, there's no rectifier here. Uh, so it's not a DC-DC converter. It's just an inverter. Um, and the specs could very well be for a fluorescent lamp ballast. Right? So you're, you want to build a resonant inverter for that application, which is one of the more, uh, or has been traditionally, one of the most common applications for uh, resonant inverters. And in fact, the LCC is a particularly good design for a fluorescent uh, lamp ballast. Right? So here are the requirements. Um, the first requirement, uh, the first requirement is, uh, is that it's going to run off uh, an input voltage of 160 volts. Uh, well, where does that come from? Well, that comes from the fact that you plug it into the line. Um, you have a line input voltage, which may be nominally, let's like, say, 115 volt RMS, somewhere between 110 and 120, um, depending on how far you are from the uh, feeder. Um, and then it just goes through a uh, rectifier, and then the rectifier just gives you the peak of that voltage because you've got a big hunk of uh, capacitor or, or you have some, uh, if, you, if it's a more expensive one, uh, not an El Cheapo uh, uh, type of a uh, fluorescent ballast, this would actually be a power factor correcting PFC type of uh, rectifier. So it would actually also have a, uh, a PWM stage inside it, inside this rectifier possibly a, uh, a boost. But for now, let's just assume it's just doing peak of the line kind of thing. So that's where uh, this voltage here is going to be your 160 volt uh, DC voltage. Right? And that is what is basically this Vn. Okay? Um, now, in order to strike the lamp, we need a large initial voltage. Right? And for this, we're, we're told that we need to get up to 400 volts of open circuit voltage to be able to strike the lamp, or at least for whatever application this is. Let's just say it's, the, it's for a ballast. So to strike the lamp, we need 400 volts. Um, and then once the lamp is on, we just run it at a nominal power of 25 watts. And it has to deliver that 25 watts uh, while operating with an output voltage of 150 volt RMS, right? Uh, the output voltage here is going to be high frequency AC, and its RMS value is 150 volt, right? Um, and the, the the frequency that we're running through the lamp ballast um, is 100 kilohertz. So this whole thing is running at 100 kilohertz switching frequency. 
okay? Those are the specs. That's what we're going to design for. Well, what does the design entail? Um, well, you basically have to go and pick values for L, CS, and CP. That's the design. Right. So let's do that. Um, so first thing we're going to do is simplify um, this resonant um, inverter down to something um, just the bare minimum that we need to sort of deal with in order to do our design. And so we can take this sort of this entire input stage and make it look like a sinusoidal uh, input voltage, right? So just do our sinusoidal approximation. So we will just call this some V sub V uh, V S hat, right? So that's just this is time. This is now in phasor domain. Um, the amplitude of V S uh, hat is just going to be equal to uh, four over pi times this DC voltage Vn, right? Uh, and this then just drives our tank. This is our L. This, sorry, this is our L. This is our series capacitor. And then our parallel capacitor Cp. And there's our resistor. Right. I will call this voltage here uh, VR, just to kind of stay consistent with our previous notation. Um, and we will call the transfer function um, up from uh, input to output VR over VS. We'll just call that H of S. Okay? That's, that's what we're going to have to, uh, that's, the, that's really the circuit we care about. And now we have to go pick values for L, C, S, and C, P. Okay. So the first thing we have to do is to make sure uh, that we can meet the load requirements, right? The load requirements were two. The first load requirement was that uh, we, when the output resistor was infinite, so when basically um, when this load resistance R goes off to infinity, uh, then our output uh, voltage, right? And that was a magnitude. That was the absolute um, uh, peak value of VR. Uh, that should just equal, and that by definition is our VOC, which is the open circuit voltage. Um, in fact, um, that has to equal 400 volts. Okay, so um, what that tells us that uh, when we know that the any resonant tank or re any resonant inverter is going to have an output characteristic that's elliptical, that's sort of shown here, and now we have one point of that uh, ellipse or one point through which that ellipse, ellipse must pass, right? And that's this uh, VOC. So this VOC must equal 400 volts. Uh, we have another uh, requirement, which is sort of the nominal operating requirement. Um, so at nominal operating, uh, we have power th that we deliver out is 25 watts. And that is at a output value VR. Um, and this is now the RMS quantity. So this is VR uh, RMS. Uh, that has to equal... Um, Remember, it was 115, 150, 150 volts. All right. uh, this must equal 150 volts. Okay. Uh, so, in terms of peak quantity, um, this translates to, uh, in terms of the peak quantity V R, this translates to 150. Uh, times square root of 2, and that is, I believe, 212 volts. I'm going to have to refer to my notes for the actual numeric values, so I'll just keep them handy. That's 212 volts, all right? Um, we can also figure out what is the current at, at this particular uh, operating point, and we can do that because we know what the power is. 
this power is just going to be uh, V R R M S times I R R M S, right? So this basically tells us that I R R M S is going to be 25 watts divided by V R R M S, which is 150 volts, and that gives us a operating current. Um, IR RMS of 0 0.167 amps and then from there we can figure out the peak value of this um, I hat R value is going to be 0 0.167 again times square root 2 and that comes out to be um, 0 0.236 amps okay uh, so this uh, set here is our second operating point, right? So we have n, we have one operating point. This is our um, well, f um, f uh, first um, operating point, and then this is our second. operating point, all right? And the first operating point has um, the current is zero, right? So the first operating point is really here, and then the second operating point is at here, so that's somewhere this, like that, 212 volts and 0 0.236 amps. Those are our two operating points. If we look at the equation for an ellipse, how many unknowns do we have there? Basically, have we have VOC and I short circuit. Those are the only free parameters we have. So once we have specified two points on an ellipse, you specified the ellipse. All right. So if somebody gives you two operating points for a resonant inverter, um, Assuming sinusoidal approximations, so you're neglecting all those sort of the uh, the impacts of uh, things that we're ignoring. Uh, you pretty much specified um, the output characteristic of that uh, resonant inverter. Okay, so now it just goes. Um, uh, now all we have to do is go and figure out what this I short circuit is because we know VOC and then we know the exact curve. All right, so let's let's do that next. Um, I'll just, um, um, yeah, so let's, and for that we, I'll just do that and then we'll take a break. So from here I can figure out what I short circuit is. Um, this is our equation. Um, yeah, so let's write this as uh, I R hat squared over I short circuit squared is equal to 1 minus uh, v r hat squared over uh, v o c squared, and therefore my i short circuit then is um, I'll just flip these, and then I'll multiply that so this becomes i r hat divided by the square root of one minus v r hat squared over v o c squared. All right. So as long as I, I know VOC and I know one operating point, I can figure out what I short circuit is, right? And the one operating point I know is uh, this one right here, 212 volts, uh, 0.36, and VOC we know is 400. So I'll plug all of these values, uh, plug, plug these three values in here, right? Um, and that basically is going to give me my I short circuit. And my I short circuit comes out to um, be 0 0.278 amps. OK? Uh, while we're on this figure, uh, let's also simply compute. Um, yeah, that, that matches. This, right? This was just a check. 
case I didn't have my notes with me. Um, uh, let's also just check what the um, nominal resistance or load resistance is at our nominal operating point. Remember this was our nominal operating point. Um, and so the nominal resistance um, R norm um, is simply going to be uh, this value uh, V R over the value I R and that's uh, 212 divided by 0 0.36 and that's approximately equal to 900 ohms. Right? Uh, the reason we're um, computing this is later on we'll try and figure out the our critical value for our the design and what we'd like is since we're doing an LLC that in order to have ZVS that our nominal is what greater or less than our critical which one would you want for an LLC LLC yeah when do you get ZVS greater than our critical Say that again. Less. 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 Our nominal has to be less than our critical, right? Yeah. Remember? Go, go back a few slides. It's LCC. LCC. Yeah, that's what it is. Did I say LLC? All right, sorry. If I said LLC, um, ignore that. Yeah. All right, so you understand what I'm saying? It's LCC, right? That's, that's, that's what it is. It's an LCC. All right. So you want a um, R nominal which will, or you will need an R critical to be greater than this to have ZVS, right? So that's why we're computing R nominal. All right, let's take a break here, um, and we will return in um, six minutes or so um, to sort of continue our second section. All right. <laughs> He has spoiled everything and I can't do these girls anymore. Shall we continue the recording till 12 o'clock or shall I stop it and then start it at 12? I can just uh, oh, just just oh, uh, stop it and then start it at twelve. Or else, like uh, I, I can just remove this. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Recording. Yeah, 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 I can yeah. Chop it off. That's fine. Let it run. So we can have two two lectures in the same recording. Uh, no, keep them two separate lectures. Two separate lectures. Yeah, so this then I'll stop it and. Stop it and start again. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.